Now, you might gather from the sound of water and the sound of stones underneath the feet that we were down on a beach over on the west of the island. Niarbal, since you're asking. Uh, and uh, a bit breezier than we thought it was going to be. It's a good Manx spring evening. You never know what you're going to get. We were hoping it was going to be lovely sunshine and nice sunsets. And instead, it's a bit overcast, a bit misty, quite cold, a bit breezy. <laughs> Other than that, all is good. See our love man. Anyway, we've uh, come down to meet up with Lara. We haven't seen her from the Wildlife Trust for some time. And, uh, yeah, I thought I'd test your knowledge. <laughs> Not really. But I thought we haven't spoken for a while about seaweeds and whenever I go out it's the one thing you can guarantee you'll see on the walk around the Isle of Man. You might not see the seabirds you're after, you might not see puffins unless you're lucky. I will guarantee you'll see seaweeds somewhere. But not many people know a great deal about them I always guess. No probably not. It's not something you tend to, to look and pay much attention to really when you're on the beach. You're usually looking for crabs and fish and more exciting things on the shore. Yeah so I mean, it does it have an important part to play. A lot of the time, like we're standing here, you see it sort of washed up. Sometimes people think, oh, it's a little bit smelly or whatever. I know there's a lot of types. I recognise one or two. And some of them, when you see them in situ, can be very beautiful. The trouble is when it's washed up on the beach, it sometimes looks a bit of a mess. It does, yeah. There are several hundreds of species of seaweeds that we see around our coasts. But it's really important, the seaweed that washes up and rots, um, it provides food for our small invertebrates which then provide food for our, our birds particularly through the winter and things like that so it's actually really important for our wildlife. Okay well show a little stroll around then and see if you can uh, maybe identify one or two of the different types we get here down at uh, at Niobel. Um There's a whole scutch in front of the stuff which has dried up so I know you get some sort of things like the bladder racks and such like are the ones that seem quite popular. Yep, yeah, we get a lot of bladder rack, and um, that tends to be more on your sheltered shores. Um, but down here at Nyarbal, we'll get things like spiral rack, serrated rack, um, channel rack, some hopefully some kelp, some like laminarias, um, and also a few green seaweeds and a few reds as well, thrown in for good measure. Okay, well, let's have a little stroll and see what we can see then. I'll follow you because you've got the boots on. <laughs> I've got, I've got trainers on before you ask. So we'll go down, head down towards the actual edge of the sea and as the tide comes in we can head back up again rather than going the opposite way. Because we don't want to get caught out, do we? No, we don't. Particularly if we've only got trainers on. Okay. some of the kelps, the laminarias and stuff, but the tide just isn't far enough out. Right, so headed right down towards the water's edge. Now the tide is coming in, you can hear the wind, you can hear the sea as well, I dare say. Good old breeze blowing in, <laughs> so we're trying not to get too wet. We we're just going down to take a look to see if we could see a little bit of kelp. It's just beyond our reach at the moment, I think. Yeah, it is. Um, it's not particularly big tide, so our kelps, our laminarias and, and, and things like that tend to be right at the bottom of the shore at low water. Because different species of seaweed can tolerate different amounts of exposure to the air. So we get a zonation up the beach for seaweeds. So the ones that can cope with being dried out for longer periods of time will, be, will find higher up the beach. They'll have mechanisms to enable them to do that. And then you have our low shore species that um, can only tolerate being exposed for short periods of time. So our kelps are those sorts of species that need, can only be exposed for a short period of time, which is why you find them at the bottom of the shore. Okie dokie. Now these ones, I'll just step back a bit, because the side's coming in a bit. So these ones here, now these are some of the racks, these ones? Yeah, absolutely. So we're sort of working our way on the lower mid-shore here. And you find in the mid-shore range, sort of in the u littoral, you get a lot of your rack species. So the one we're looking at here is our serrated rack. And the name, very conveniently, is a definition of it. You can see the serrated Oh yeah, serrated edges. edge. Yeah. So that's really obvious and really clear. We tend to find this at the lower edge towards the low water mark um, and it can cope with 
moderately exposed shores. They don't tend to have air bladders, those bladders, gas bladders, so they can cope with more of a, an exposed shore. And they're really great for hiding things underneath them as well. The, the, the dampness, although the top might have dried out, the underside is nice and wet, so snails like our um, flat, um, flat periwinkles and limpets and things can hide underneath them and get maintain a, sort of a moisture nice and damp and including some of our beadlet and enemies there that like the dampness as oh, well yeah. yeah just underneath the weeds there so this is the uh, the uh, serrated rack here so it's the one with this sort of quite sort of fern like leaf lovely dark at least when you see it out of the water it's just a really nice dark greeny brown you'll sort of catch it as and the one with the serrated edge you mentioned some of the ones with air sacs the one like this with the so sort of you see the little balloons on that's the straight bladder rack is it the bladder rack yeah but some of the other species also have um, air bladders and i'll show you some of those as we we go up the beach marvelous and this little guy here is this from the same just stuck on the sock this tiny little one do we know this one um it's a different oh no yeah it's a it's just a new growth for the for the um for the serrated, serrated. rack here yeah so that'll be the same as the others that we're looking at yeah Terrific. Right, so the masses of this, this is the one you might will see a lot of right down by the shoreline. Uh, one of the more common ones, as Laura says. And again, you can just get down, have a little look, and you can still tell, because indeed, it says what it uh, does on the tin. You look at the side of the leaf and it's serrated, hence serrated rack. So, OK, right, let's paddle up a little bit. Whoops, and see where we can go. We're just escaping the tide. It's coming up as fast as my heels, I tell you. Uh, I can always take my shoes off if needs be. You know? Should have brought you Ellie's Howard. I should, well, I, I almost put my paddlers on, but <laughs> I should have done. All right, so go a little a bit up. It's amazing how quickly that tide comes in. Um, a small sort of feather-like green seaweed here. Ah, yes, I've got this one. So again, it's sort of glued down a little bit. It does look like green, almost sort of like hair stuck. It's matted and wet. Never looks as pretty as it does out of the water as it does when you see pictures underwater of course but yeah it's like a sort of fine green hair almost glued to the sub substrate and the rock yeah. underneath it at the moment very fine filamentous green so this is cladophora Clodif rupestris it doesn't have a common name oh i knew it, it. Just, just looks like green hair basically short green hair nice dark olive green and that's Cladophorus, what was that one again? Cladophora rupestris. Rupestris, wow. We could do with a common name for that one. You ought I to know. invent one, Laura. Green hair. <laughs> <laughs> I like you didn't it. stretch the imagination I too far on that one. But I like it to reflect what, what it looks like. It makes it easy, like serrated racks, got serrated edges. I think you're right. Right, from henceforth on the Isle of Man, <laughs> this Cladosporus is going to be known as green hair seaweed because that's what it is, quite frankly. I think it'd be so much more beautiful. I know you go diving quite a bit. I assume when you see this under the water, it's waving around rather attractive. Yeah, it's very pretty. Yeah, it just opens up. Yeah, rather gorgeous. Clumps. It's all just sort of clumped and down and like your hair is when you, you know, when you get it soaking wet and it sticks to your scalp at the moment. But uh, yeah, when the tide comes back in again, as it's doing rapidly behind us, it will start floating up and... Uh, I think it'll look a lot more attractive. Okay, there's your green hair seaweed. Uh, this little broad one here, is this sort of like a strap, uh, some sort of strap type seaweed? You see a few of these almost look like belts. Any idea what this one yes. is? So this is one of our um, Laminaria species, most likely Laminaria digitata, so ore weed. So one of our kelps, but just a very small version here um, that we would usually find a bit lower down. Lovely. Okay, so a couple more there. Again, these are the ones you'll see around your shoreline. So easy to see if you're out and about, and uh, I, I often think when I go for a walk, it's one thing you can guarantee on the other man. Seaweed's everywhere. So you may as well find out a little bit more about them and have a little think more. Oh, here we are. What have we got here? Right, stuck on the top of a rock a bit further up. Ah, now then. Now, so is that into your bladder right now? or? Uh, this isn't bladder rack, but this, as, as you rightly can see um it's got air bladders on it but they're not paired and that's one of the giveaways for bladder rack but this is egg rack or knotted rack um, and these bladders can form quite large sized um filled bladders um, and you find these they tend to form very long fronds this is quite stunted because here we're quite an exposed site so they tend to keep quite short but the the let the fronds or the leaves um, can grow very long um, on sheltered shores and can form massive dense 
areas but in this case because it's quite an exposed site the, the growth is quite stunted but what's interesting about this and is a bit of a giveaway if you're unsure what you're looking at is this is a type of red seaweed called polysiphona linosa and this red sea, fluffy red seaweed is often found associated with this specific seaweed with this um, egg rack so you find it in clumps growing on it all oh, right so so is it sort of like an epiphyte or is it or how does yeah. that, that work an epiphyte yeah, yeah absolutely so it attaches to it um polysiphonia species there's loads of them they're very difficult to identify um but generally it's always polysiphonia linosa that will associate with egg rack um but normally you need a microscope to identify these normally polysiphonia species there, there's a lot of them and involves a lot of um, microscope work so yeah so this is our egg rack fantastic so there's yeah egg rack really nice and the this other one is glorious it's all sort of, it's almost got a lovely feel to the hand and sort of almost looks moss like yeah. on sort of strands fantastic it's a bit pom-pommy without not quite round yeah, like yeah. a pom-pom but got that sort of fluffy almost fleecy feel to it hasn't it actually it has it needs another common name again pom-pom seaweed it? <laughs> i think there already is a pom-pom type seaweed actually <laughs> so we'd be copying names I'm liking that though. Right, okay, egg rack, that's really pretty. That's another one you see quite a so bit of. The egg rack is, is Ascophyllum nodosum. I prefer egg rack. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so if you see them in, in what? No, in ones or twos, it's egg rack, and the other one, which way around was it? So, bladder rack has parallel d double bladders all the way up and tends to be on more sheltered shores, whereas egg rack has one bladder sort of as you go down yeah. quite often you'll find one or two just as you go down. And the air bladders are to allow them to float, to, for the fronds to float to the surface to maximize the light that they can receive for photosynthesis. So they do, again, because I suppose a few people might think, well, if you're under the water and a totally different sort of lifestyle surviving in a very harsh environment where you spend half your time under brined, you know, salty water and then half your time exposed to the air, but they do sort of photosynthesize like sort of land plants? Absolutely, yeah. They, they need light to be able to photosynthesize. The, the difference with um, sort of seaweeds and plants is seaweeds don't have roots to draw up nutrients from the soil. They have a hold fast instead. And as the name suggests, it's literally to hold them fast to the rocks. So all of their nutrients that they obtain comes through their fronds, what we know as leaves, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how they photosynthesize. Okie dokie. Let's go a little pedal further up, see if there's anything else we can see. I think we've got some spiral rack coming up. Spiral rack, we're liking that. We like the ones with nice, easy names. Mm. There we we'll go. Let's go a bit further up yet. Yeah. We've still got a lot of serrated rack here. Loads down here, yeah, yeah, all dotted around the stuff we were looking we at a bit. Sort of running on a parallel, we need to go a bit further up to, to get that higher level. Okay, all <coughs> right, we'll paddle on a bit. See what we can see. It's good news because we're getting away from the, the incoming tide. Let's see what else we can see up this neck of the woods. At least the weather's holding a bit, which is nice. Go. you're starting to see it come in this just here now you can see that this um another fucus um fucus spiralis um is spiral rack and what happens is this it starts to twist the fronds will start to twist again and that's how it gets its name ah yes this is glued it's in fact it's glued itself to a a, lim a limpet is it yeah, or a, yeah limpet yeah, limpet, yeah. It actually stuck onto the uh, limpet <laughs> and there's hanging down from that rather spectacularly. So this is the beginning of a small spiral wreck. Yes, it's maybe not the best specimen. We'll find some more further up the shore. Um, okay, let's go a bit up and see what we can see. You can see here how the egg rack has grow, grows much longer. It really grows really quite long in areas where it's a bit more sheltered. Yeah, that's glorious, and it's got the, I've forgotten the name of this one again already, what's this little one that goes along with it, the gorgeous mossy one? Polysiphona lanosa. It is, <laughs> definitely needing an easy name for that one. Exactly. Glorious. And, um, and then you can see the bladders on those are quite large. Yeah, they are quite a size on that. Not, again, the best of specimens, but you can see the spiral, the twist in the fronds. Might have curled your hair.
<laughs> a tool to kill my hair. Yes, you can see it in that, can't you? Yeah. Twisting round. Glorious. Yeah. Hence the name, yeah. Well named. Yeah. I know, very easily remembered. So these are some of the really common species you'll find on any of our beaches. Um, again, it depends on the exposure as to what sort of, how much of each species you'll find. Um, but generally these are something you'll find on mo most of our beaches, sort of in the mid tidal range. Glorious. Okay, so a small one there. Let's see as we're heading back up, if there's anything else we can spot while we're here. A little bit further up onto a bank of seaweed here on the rocks. Ah, yeah, Sweet. some more spiral rack here. Yeah, so this is a great mm. example of the sort of zonation you can see in a vertical sense with height. So at the top here, we haven't talked about the, this yet. This is channel rack, pelvisia. And if you look closely at it, you'll see it forms these lovely little channels on one side. It's as if half the leaf has curled up to allow it to um, just oh. curl up around the edges and it forms these channels, hence the name channel rack. And because it's so high up the shore, it's going to be exposed to the atmosphere, to the air for a long period of time. This allows them to trap moisture in that channel and keeps it moist for longer. So it's an Clever. adaption to, to that environment. So that's why you find them much higher up the shore compared to the others species but what's really great is you've got at the top here the pelvisia this channel rack and then you've got this lovely band of spiral rack here and then as you come down into the lower waters below you've then got your egg rack again so yep, it's that lovely down. nice zonation and you can see that as you walk from the low water up to high water on a beach you'll get that lovely zonation of of seaweeds it is terrific. It's like a sort of a marine hanging basket, isn't it? With the sort of it is. It's beautiful. Yes, the different yeah. levels going down as you drop down and actually hanging down the rocks. And like I said, I've never really gone diving, but you always think it probably looks so much prettier when you actually see it underwater. And it's definitely yeah. when it's sort of floating and and in the water a lot more. It is much prettier. Yeah, snorkeling or diving, you get to really appreciate it a lot more um, than than you do when it's just draped over the rocks here. But like I said, it, it traps lots of moisture in underneath it, so it's great for a lot of other species that, that need to maintain that level of, of dampness um, compared to some other species, so it's great. Terrific. Okay, what else have we got? Right, let's see. I think we've got some green seaweed further up. Okay. We've got some gut that I saw. Oh, that sounds promising. Right, so we're almost back up to, sort of to uh, the shoreline again now. Oh, the top of the shore, just on the uh, below the wall, the arbor, if you know the arbor at all. Aha, now we are onto a very so most of these other ones, the racks we've been looking at, <coughs> and the spiral rack and the egg rack have all been that usual really dark brown, olive brown. Now we're coming up to one of the much brighter, it looks more like a, a lichen or a moss sort of, uh, sort of seaweed, which is that much brighter green. Yes, so this is known as gutweed. So it's an ulva species. Um, there's several species, so it's quite difficult to identify them. But if you look at them, it forms these little strings, sort of, and they look a bit gut-like. They do? <laughs> like your intestines. You can see them sort of floating here in the rock pool, and you can kind of make out all the little strands and the little, um, little strings of intestines. Um, so it's known as gut weed, and quite often these are associated with a fresh water output somewhere. So the prime example, the fact that there's the runoff there coming in yeah, yeah. from here. Um, and this is one of our edible species as well. Actually, a lot of our seaweeds are edible. Um, you can dry them, you can fry them, but you need to get as much moisture out of them as possible because when you fry them with the water, it spits a lot. <laughs> well, funnily enough, you've... you've, 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 you've <laughs> read my mind because I was going to mention before we finished today that I, I do know quite a few of them are edible and I was wondering whether you were a, someone who's sampled a few seaweeds and I know it's a bit of um, an acquired taste for some. Absolutely yeah um, it's it's fine I don't think it tastes of a lot I mean I've had it fried crisps think about you know your um, sushi that you have um, 
you know, that sort of seaweed, that's kind of, it's okay. I don't think there's a lot of flavour to them. You can dry it and make it into a powder and use it for salads to add to seasoning for stews. Yeah, and I've had course, that. Someone's given me dried stuff before yeah, I've used. Yeah, um, and laver bread that the Welsh have. And um, that seaweed, um, it's um, a, a, a laver, it's made from um, a certain seaweed um, and you mix it with rolled oats. So it's not actually a bread at all. It's more of a sort of a gloop and you can put it on toast and things like that. And that's meant to be a real sort of delicacy. I think someone referred to it as Welsh caviar. Um, I'm not quite sure it's the same thing, but, but yeah, it's a very popular thing in Wales anyway. Yeah, it's a sort of, um, I suppose in a way you could, you could see it as a sort of, a, not quite a wasted resource, but something that is all around us. And uh, the only stuff I've ever tried is a little bit of some of the dried stuff and the one which I have seen occasionally, which they, um, I only know to sea lettuce, which is like a little, yes. yeah. Yeah, I was looking for that. I haven't seen it here yet, but um, sea lettuce is um, similar similar to the gutweed and yeah again you can eat that and the porphyra species are the um this is the seaweed you make for laver bread um and it forms these sort of flat sort of browny purple sheets that sort of up the upper uh, areas of the the tide i was hoping we might have found some today but there doesn't appear to be any but you can find it in in, in douglas on the on the prom wall there um i've seen it there in other places um but obviously if you are going to eat seaweed choose your sites very very carefully um certain seaweeds will absorb um things that you wouldn't necessarily want to eat shall we say so if you are going to pick seaweeds make sure you choose a really clean site is this safe here um yeah i'd probably say niarbles is is pretty good yeah all right I well, think so. well in that case we could try a little nibble then yeah so let's just try a small piece of this so you can go first <laughs> Thank you. Well, it doesn't look too unappetising. It's green. It's sort of mossy. It doesn't smell of a great deal. Got a little bit of sand there, unfortunately, like sort of sandwiches on the beach. Because sea lettuce is also meant to be quite good for... Um, it's high in protein as well. You think it's going to taste very salty, and it doesn't. No, it just doesn't taste it very much. Not a great all, deal. It? It's no. sort of slightly green. No. Not a hugely strong flavor. I'm a bit disappointed. I thought there'd be a stronger flavour to it. There's yeah, actually much there. Things like pepper dulse and things like that have a, a stronger flavour. Um, those sorts of seaweeds. But a lot of the sort of greens are quite, you know, just quite plain. Yeah. And Not bland. unpleasant, just a bit yeah. bland. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, there we go. But as you say, do be very careful if you're wanting to have a little nibble of something, unless you know what you're doing. Either ask an expert or with some good books around and just be very careful. Don't be silly if you're going out and obviously don't wreck any any environments either you just take little bits like anything if you're doing a bit of foraging take a little bit for what you need and leave plenty for anyone else and for the environment and all the other creatures as well don't be greedy in other words right let's see what else there is i think i've got as much stone as i've got seaweed <laughs> just having a little bit of a look in a rock pool and the rock looks pink and that's because it's a type of pink calcified red seaweed um, it could be one of many species of the lithothamnion family um, and they come in this sort of pale pink to sort of a mauvey colour to sort of a deep rich plummy colour so they come in a variety of pinky purple shades and you'll find them intertidally and also subtidally um, so a great place to see them is rock pools when you're out and exploring on the shore um, but uh, this is a lovely pink colour but you'll find them when you go diving and snorkelling as well okay so that's the, is that this under here yes. this actually here like looks remarkably like a lichen or something yes yeah. yeah wow yeah, just like that and it forms this hard crust so it's sort of related to the family of um of the red pink merle you know or marl depending on how you pronounce yep. it that um calcified red seaweed that forms the little nodules that look like jumping jacks that it's a really important habitat around the isle of man um this is a similar family to that another calcified red seaweed wow no i didn't know i've never known that one before that's great so if you look out for that like it is a pinky color just in this rock pool where laura and i are standing now and again it looks for all the world like a, a lichen on a rock but under the water here something to look out for if you go rock pooling a little shrimp there as well we noticed which is nice to see 
Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I didn't want to find it, but I found it. Because uh -huh. we get it here. Okay, so this is something else you've just uh, dredged up here. Now, are you going to tell me this is an invasive species? It is indeed, yes. This is wireweed or Sargassum muticum. Um, and as you can see, all these little bits, I've just pulled a bit up, is all breaks off and then that goes and grows somewhere else. It's like almost like dandelion seeds. Yeah, yeah. It spreads really rapidly. And you can see here I've got two tiny air bladders there. So you can see that they're absolutely covered in these little air bladders. And again, that helps them um, reach the surface um, and, and get the, the best possible light for um, photosynthesizing. It's invasive species. Um, come from the sort of Far East Japan way, we think. And um, it's prolific on the Isle of Man, intertidally and subtidally. You find it in rock pools if you're on the beach, but generally we'll find it diving as well. And it outcompetes our native species. It grows very, very quickly and, and smothers um, anything else and takes up the space of a rock pool, for example. But they form these lovely sort of washing lines. I've just ripped a bit off badly, but you have that main string and then you have all of which is your main washing line. Then you all have the little branches hanging down from that, like a washing line, like your laundry. So um, yes, this is a one that we find everywhere around the Isle of Man, um, which is a real shame. But um, and is, yeah. is there much we can do to to stop it spreading? Or? Not really, because the problem is because it is like thistle, um, thistle heads. The minute you try and pull it up, you just it starts to disintegrate. So it's a very difficult one to control, unlike some of our other invasive species. Yeah. So we just have to, well, we just have to live with it. Does it, is there any danger that it would sort of quite literally sort of smother out another native species, or is it just going to be a bit of a, a pain so that as we, like we're doing today, scrambling around rocks, you just find patches where it's there sort of competing with the other weeds? Um, it could do. In some areas it has completely smothered harbours and it, it can form very dense beds and when it does that actually um, in the harbour that it where this happened it actually wrapped around the props of boats and basically made it impassable so they had to do something about it but here on the Isle of Man it doesn't seem to be causing a problem as such yet oh. she said <laughs> don't tempt fate yes um, <laughs> but obviously it's something we want to keep an eye on and things like that so when people do find it um, if they would report it to Manx Wildlife Trust that would be amazing that would be really helpful Lovely. And I think there was a little book at one stage where you could actually had pictures and you could pick up. Yeah, we've still got some of those, so you can pick them up from the shop or you can also find a digital version on our website as well. Great. So if you don't know what you're looking for, you can uh, go online or, like I said, if you like a hard copy of something, you can stick into your pocket, your backpack, whatever, when you're out about in the summer, drop into the wildlife shop and they'll be able to help you out there and uh, report it back and we'll get a better... Like all these things, the more we know about it, we know about the spread and the sort of the better data set we have, the better we informed we are and uh, which is always makes it easier when you're talking about conservation issues and such like one we don't want necessarily okay i'm going to allow lara to go paddling down that pool for a second <coughs> to see if there's anything down the far end oh just found something else that went over my welly <laughs> <laughs> That's state. You should have brought waders. See, I should have. Oh yeah, you should have brought waders, and I should have put my little wading sandals on. Aha! Uh -huh. Now this is very small. It is. It's. It's not the biggest of specimens, but um, this is another red seaweed, Corallina officinalis. So it has these lovely sort of. It's well, it's a terrible specimen, really. These lovely sort of little branches that come up, and right at the very tips of the branches. They're just dotted in white and it's um, a very distinctive seaweed. I know it might not look like it from this terrible yeah, specimen. Yeah, I can see I the little white dots, yeah. But yes, um, and they form like little segments. Each section you can see there are individual little segments as it works its way up to the little dots. It almost looks like they're snow covered. It's very nice. And does it get, I mean, this is tiny, so this is what we're looking at on Laura's hand is only an inch or two long and just on the end of her fingers, but it gets to what, a few inches? Yeah, it'll get to a few inches in size. You'll find, well, this is in rock pools again, um, easier to find there. And then obviously we find it subtidally when we're diving as well. It needs to be immersed all the time, so you'll find it in rock pools. Yeah. Oh, very pretty, small, delicate, not one you're going to see easily unless you know what you're looking for. Terrific. And this, this pool is above welly, welly height, so I'm staying out of range. <laughs> I 
Now then, just as we're scrambling back, a much better example of something we've been looking at. This is a, looks really pretty actually under the water now. It's sort of it's, you can see that pink. You can see the little white dots, and a much better specimen. Yeah, it is. There's some quite a few plants in here now. Much better than the last specimen I showed you. Really very pretty. It is. It's terrific that one. Now you, you can see that one again. That pink. It is distinctive because it's got lovely pink little fronds. Very delicate. Small. We're only talking about an inch, two inches, three inches in length so it's not a great big long one like the bladder racks and the egg racks we we're looking at much more delicate a distinctive pinky color not green or the brown it is without a doubt got a pink tinge and these lovely little white dots in the ends are quite distinctive if you look out for that one give us the name again Coralina officinalis uh, it's another one that doesn't have a common name we'll call it pink and pretty <coughs> lovely yeah, it is pretty Right, okay, we managed to scramble off the rocks back down onto uh, the sand above the tide line. Now, here's one you see knocking around quite a bit. Now, unlike the last one, this is one of those massive ones. It looks like you could seriously club someone over the head with this really substantial stem, which is sort of an inch, an inch and a half in diameter, and then long, sort of frond like leaves at the end. I've seen this one quite a bit, but I don't know the name. So it's Laminaria digitata, so all weeds. So this is the one I'd hoped to have shown you down um, at the low shore, but because the tide was um, coming in too quickly, we didn't get a chance to see it. So this is um, one that's washed up. So this stem is called a stipe. Um, and the whole fast is ripped off, so you can't see that now. Quite often that will still be attached to the rock and uh, it rips off from the base of that. So we've got a strong stipe here that's really good to... Um, help them reach the surface and then at the end here it is, it's really solid too it's yeah it is really solid mm. yeah and then at the end you have these um the fronds or the leaves as we call them and they form um uh, finger-like projections um that float and it, this this one obviously because it's been ripped off is looking a bit tatty but you get all sorts of things that will attach to those as well hydroids onto the leaves here we've got a red seaweed here um called red rags that you find um in it subtidally and quite often there's a lot of things that will grow on the stipe of the stem so quite often you'll find lots of red seaweeds you might get sponges and other things that grow on so this is a separate this. species here. yes this is a separate species yeah so this is a red seaweed so i didn't realize i must admit that sort of you had so many of these sort of um epiphytic sort of relationships yeah. going on with one species growing on another without yeah. seemingly harming the host and then this as well, um, again, another epiphyte on an epiphyte. So oh it's a Lord. bryozoan or a sea mat. So it's a colony of lots and lots and lots of little animals all living together, um, wow, quite often that. growing on the, on the seaweeds. That's amazing. Yeah. I've never seen that before. And, and these are tiny. About, they're yeah. really tiny. You just about make them out. I think of blocks of flats, but instead of growing upwards, they grow flat. And there's each is, is occupied by a tiny animal, filter feeding animal. Right, so they are actually like little tiny what sort of tiny mollusks or something rather that's not actually a weed or a plant, it is actually an animal. It is an animal, wow. yep. Yeah. Um they're known as sea mats, bryozoans, so they're lots of little animals all together. Wow. And they have like a tentacle that basically when they're in the water that comes out and will grab any food particles moving past, so filter feeders. But you'll get things like sponges and other things growing on the stipe here. There's another bryozoan of some sort there. and um, this one's quite clean but you'll get all sorts of things growing up and in around the holdfasts of the seaweeds as well you'll get um, sea squirts and sponges and um, lots of like little marine snails gastropods will tuck in underneath to get away from predators and, and um, things like that so they're really important part of the ecosystem they're amazing and this one likes it really substantial shame you couldn't eat that you get a real good meal if you got to <laughs> manage to cut that one up and I've never seen these before I must admit I'm not aware of those at all and I certainly wouldn't have known that it were actually, it just almost looks like a mold or a fungus sort of growing on the leaf that you might see if you're looking at your roses or something, see almost like a, a fungus or a mold on it. But actually the fact it's a colony of small creatures, amazing, amazing. Should have brought the handle ends. Terrific stuff. Well, thank you ever so much. We can't leave just without mentioning, because I know a lot of people, hopefully we've inspired people to go and take a look at some of the seaweeds around the place oh this is the now this is where it roots onto the rock yeah so this is sorry to interrupt not at all but we've just found a hold fast to one of the the kelps and what i was just showing howard is the fact that you can see these lovely sponges growing in amongst the, oh, those nice. roots that aren't obviously a traditional root system but look just like roots and you can see where it's ripped off on the rock there but you can see the sponge underneath oh yes i hadn't seen that before either wow 
That's amazing. You see, and this is what I love about doing these, that you see these things. I'd have never seen these before without going out with an expert like Laura to actually show you around. And hopefully, like I said, we've whetted your appetite if you're out and about just to think a little bit more. Go into the Wildlife Trust. I'm sure you can get a seaweed book in the shop there. You can certainly get the uh, little book there on invasive species to look out for. And just to whet your appetite, if you'll excuse the pun, to find out more about this fantastic array of weeds, which is so easy to just walk past and think nothing of and just think, oh, they're smelly, rotten bits of sort of dying. It's not. It's such a fascinating sort of habitat in itself. And such a range of stuff. We've just scratched the surface here of the common ones around the Isle of Man. And what was I going to say was the ones people might have heard of, particularly when we're talking about marine nature reserves and uh, particular habitats around the Isle of Man, are the seagrasses and the eelgrasses. Now, is this completely separate again? Yes. So these are seaweeds. They're not actually plants as we know them, but our sea grass and our eelgrass is the only marine flowering plant so they have roots in the same way that our terrestrial plants do they're the only flowering plant so it's different from our seaweeds um, and just as vitally important as our seaweeds so again so need protection need to look out of them great if you see any of these just be aware of them and enjoy these habitats and like i said hopefully go out and find a little bit more and uh, you might be surprised at just how much there is around you might become an expert as well thanks to laura Thanks very much. Great. Right, we'll go and, um, well, Laura's going to pour the water out of her wellies and I'll see how wet my socks are. <laughs> Is that enough? Is that all right? Yeah, brilliant.